Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, would you open to Acts chapter 2? I almost said Luke chapter 2. This morning we will look at Acts 2, 41 through 47. And I would like to read those verses to you and remind you, these are the words inspired by the word, by the spirit of the living God. Give them their appropriate respect. So then, those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, Continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we are continuing to look at this great and awesome day of Pentecost and what happened as a result of the outpouring of your Spirit. And I pray that that same Spirit that worked in these thousands two millennia ago would fill this place and work in these hundreds to effect the same thing. That the day of Pentecost and the Spirit's work would continue in this body. That we would find ourselves devoted with the same passion, with the same selflessness as was first created when the Spirit was poured out upon the church. Do that, I pray, for our good and for the exaltation of your Son, Jesus. Amen. A Spirit-filled Christian. What is that? What comes to your mind when you hear the phrase, Spirit-filled Christian? Does it conjure up images of something that you would desperately like to be? Things, events, activities, experiences that you wish were true of you? Does it conjure up things that you don't want to be? People that you have seen act in the name of being filled with the Spirit, and you think, I don't want any part of that. Does it draw to mind doing things extraordinarily, things that can't be explained Things that are kind of out there, risk takers, people who are not too controlled by their own mind and will, but the Spirit has controlled them completely. What does it conjure up when you think of a Spirit-filled life? How about a Spirit-filled church? What does it look like? Again, do you think of things you wish we were more like? Do you think of things you're glad we're not more like? What does it mean for a church to be filled with the Spirit? Does it mean there's no planning that goes on? We come together and, and we just let the Spirit lead? There are those who would say that, for instance, in corporate worship, that a Spirit-led service means that somebody gets up with a guitar or sits at the piano 
and just sings as they feel the Spirit leading them. That may be true, although the Bible never speaks in those terms. Is a Spirit-filled church one in which we all just sit and wait until the Spirit moves on someone to speak? where someone has a a prophetic utterance given by the Holy Spirit, or people are speaking in strange tongues. Maybe a case can be made for that, although it's not a watertight case, because there are some holes in that argument. What is a Spirit-filled church? What does it look like? Are we a Spirit-filled church? Well, you may answer that question differently, from one another. But when we look here at Acts 2 in the verses I read, we see the original Spirit-filled church and the originally Spirit-filled Christians. What we're going to find is that the Spirit, as it filled, as He filled God's people, were committed and devoted with a passion to four things. The teaching of the apostles fellowship, eating meals together, and praying. Those are the things that we can draw specifically from the Scripture that describe a Spirit-filled church and Spirit-filled Christians. Now let me catch you up in the context remind you where we are. This is the day of Pentecost and, and following. Peter, after the apostles had been filled with the Spirit when the tongues of fire came down, Peter stood up and started preaching to the Jews who were gathered there, and he proclaimed Christ to them. He declared to them the wonderful things of God. Then he reminded them of who Jesus was, what he had done, the miracles he had performed. And then he called to their attention the fact that they were responsible for the death of Christ. They had crucified the Son of God, the promised Messiah, Reminded them of Joel 2 when God had said, I will pour out my spirit upon all of my people before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he says, you are responsible for killing Messiah. The day of the Lord is coming and you must be forgiven. And they responded saying, how? We get it. We believe you. We are sinners against God. What do we do? And Peter said, repent. Change your thinking about Christ Change your mind about who he is. Accept him as Messiah. Accept him as the Son of God. Repent and be baptized, showing that you need to be washed and cleansed, and you will be forgiven of all your sins, and the Spirit will be poured out upon you. And Luke tells us that on that day, there were 3,000 who accepted the message of Peter, who believed that Jesus was Messiah. They repented, they were baptized into Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God filled them. 3,000 on this one day, and notice how Luke puts it in verse 41. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls, which begs the question, added by whom? Who did the adding here? Well, it could be they added themselves, right? They heard the message and they responded. They added themselves to the, to the church. Maybe it was Peter. Maybe we should give credit to Peter for this because he did preach a powerful sermon, wonderful, true, accurate, persuasive. But Luke doesn't leave us to figure out the answer. He knows us better than that. Remember verse 47, the end, the last sentence? And the Lord was adding to their number day by day. Do you see what Luke is doing here? He's referring back to what Joel prophesied. God said through Joel, all that are called by my name, all that I call by my, to myself, all that are called by the Lord will be saved before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Peter also referring to that verse, said, if you will repent and be baptized, you will be filled with the Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. And what's the next phrase? And all, or as many as, the Lord will call to himself. Jesus calls believers to the church. 
We talked about this last week. The Spirit blows where He will. We cannot just conjure up the Spirit's work. We can be persuasive and powerful in our preaching. We can have a lot of great expressions of the gospel, a lot of great media, a lot of great stories of what God has done. But if the Spirit of God does not blow into the place and convert hearts, nobody will come. The Lord said to Peter and to the apostles, I will build my church. You won't do it. They won't finally figure out how 2,000 years from now. I will build it. It's my church. No one gets in apart from the express invitation of the Lord himself. It's his church. He controls the keys to the kingdom. He lets people in on his own his own free will. And Luke wants us to get this. He does it in verse 41 and verse 47. That's what we call an inclusio. Remember, we've talked about that in various contexts. He wants us to understand this principle. If you're in the church, it's because the Lord has added you. Let me encourage you strongly as we head into this Thanksgiving week. Give thanks to the Lord that he added you that he called you, that the Spirit of God moved in your life to come to faith in Christ. So the Spirit is poured out. 3,000 are drawn to Jesus Christ and are added to the church. And here's what they did. They were continually devoting themselves. This is an emphatic term. They're persevering in this. They are laboring in this. They were working hard at this. This is what preoccupies them. Here are the four things, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Let's look at these individually. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Our brother Steve Forster has written a song that we sing here a lot. It's a very simple song. You remember this? Lord, I want to live my life for Jesus. I want to know the one or the man who set me free. Lord, I want to live my life for Jesus because he gave his life for me. Every minute, every hour, I can't say it without singing it. What's the next phrase? Every day I live, Jesus is the one I want my life, my all to give. See, I almost started singing because you know how that goes. What is, the, what is the point of that song? I just want to know Jesus. My life now as a new creation in Christ is simply for Him. And I want to know Him. I want to know Him more tomorrow than I do today and more the next day than tomorrow. These 3,000 souls who got it, who understood who Jesus was, wanted to be with the apostles because they had been with Jesus. They wanted to hear what Jesus wanted them to know. They wanted to be taught by those who had been empowered by Christ himself, commissioned by Christ himself to reveal the truth of Jesus Christ. They just wanted to know Jesus, and these guys had been with them. Tell us, what did he say? What did he command? These apostles would gather day after day after day with these thousands of people and teach them how to read the Old Testament as Christians. They would repeat over and over and over the stories of being with Christ. Not to brag about themselves. Not to say, oh yeah, I was there when they did that. I was the one that said, guys, quit worrying about the storm. You know, Jesus come right up here in a minute and shut it down. Just be patient. But no, the other 11, they went down and said, gotta wake him up, we're scared. Which one do you think that was? That's probably Peter, right? No, they weren't bragging about themselves. They were saying, here are the words of God incarnate. Here's how we should obey him. Here's what we should learn from him. Here's what he taught us and let us taught you. They wanted to hear and and obey and respond to the teaching of these men who were the sent ones from Christ. It makes perfect sense, does it not? Now, follow with me here for a minute. We must guard against falling into two ditches. Over here, there's a ditch which says, well, the Bible teaches truth. And because I care about truth, I'm going to study it to gain truth. 
And anything I can't rationally conclude and draw out, I'm not going to believe, I'm not going to experience, I'm going to frown upon. The Spirit of God works in the Word, and the only thing He does is draw us to propositional truth. And there are temptations for us to become so cerebral, so cognitive in our Christianity that we completely abandon and reject and ignore and, frankly, frown upon anything that we can't quite figure out. Then again, there's the other side that we can fall into, which says, I'm not going to get all wrapped up in theology and doctrine and truth because that just, that just divides people. I'm just going to let the Spirit work through me. I'm just going to listen to the Spirit. I'm just going to be Spirit-filled. But did you notice the very first thing mentioned for these Spirit-filled Christians in the first Spirit-filled church? They were devoted continually to the teaching of the apostles. Spirit-filled Christians long for the truth. And beloved, we have the teaching of the apostles. Those men are long dead, but their writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in, endures. And we must be diligent students of it. We must be devoted as they were. If we are Spirit-filled, we are going to have a longing, a hunger and thirst for His Word, for the teaching of these men who are with Him. And we're going to want to study. And we're not going to fall into either side, into either ditch. But we are going to be filled with the Spirit and study diligently the teaching of the apostles. Second thing he lists is fellowship. It's the Greek word koinonia. You have probably heard that word, koinonia. It comes from the, the root which means common. They held everything in common. Now, when we start to develop relationships with people, one of the things we look for is something we have in common with them. Oftentimes, when we talk about getting a guy and a girl together and thinking maybe they would be good as a husband and wife, we think because they have so much in common. Or you've heard couples who kind of test the waters a little bit and decide, no, we're not good for each other, and sometimes they'll say, it's because we didn't have anything in common. And I hear Christians say, I'm not going to belong to that church anymore. I'm not going to fit in there because I don't have anything in common with those people. Now, I can understand in a marriage relationship deciding not to go forward because you don't find a lot of common ground. And I can understand a lot of clubs and organizations where you don't stay committed to it because you don't have a lot in common. But how in the world do you not find things in common with Christians? Because we have the only thing that matters in common. Our fellowship is not on being white Anglo-Saxon Americans. Our commonality would not be focused on being black Africans or any other race. That's not what would unite us. We're not... Be, we're not fellowshipping because we have similar lifestyles, because we have uh, similar incomes, those are not the things that bind the church together. Let me remind you of what the Apostle John would write a little while later about commonality among Christians. Here's what he said, 1 John 1, 1 and following. What was from the beginning... What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and of course he's talking about Christ here, and the life was manifested, we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, and here's the reason, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What unites us? Where do we find common ground? It's the Father and the Son. Why do we need anything else to have in common to get along? Why do we need to find some other reason to bind together? We have the eternal life as our unifying source. If our fellowship is based on anything other than Christ and His gospel, that doesn't describe the church. 
That doesn't mean we can't hang out with people that do different things that we like to do. That's fine. But our true fellowship, what binds us in common ground, is Christ. And if that's true, beloved, we can have fellowship with any other Christian. No matter what their background, no matter what their income, no matter what their interests and hobbies, no matter what their age. Are you telling me that that if you're 20-something, you can't have fellowship with someone who's 60-something if you both love Jesus? And if the Holy Spirit has worked in both your hearts and you're going to spend eternity together, how can you not find common ground with someone else who has been bought by Christ and added to his church? Sometimes I'm afraid that we categorize things the way the world categorizes things rather than the way the Bible categorizes things. This is our common bond. And if this church and this fellowship is based on anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're on a dangerous path. On the other hand, if it is bound and determined by Christ, we have everything in common. And we can enjoy true fellowship. And if we have true fellowship, it spills over into our actions. Here's what John went on to write in chapter 3, verse 16. He says, We know love by this. He laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If we've been incorporated into his body, then just like our elder brother died for us, we should be willing to die for our fellow brothers and sisters. Now, we may think, because we do this in marriage as, as husbands, I, I give my life for my wife. I, I give myself up like Jesus did. I would take the bullet for her. I would step in front of the car for her. I would physically, literally save her life and give up mine to do it. And we think about our brothers and sisters. Yeah, I would, I would give up my life. I would take a bullet for you. But John gets to a much harder outworking of this love. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. For many of us, giving up our possessions for a brother in need is harder than stepping in front of the car. But that's the kind of expression of this fellowship that comes out in those who truly understand the gospel. We saw that all over Acts 2. Did you see? Did you notice what they did? All who believed were together. They had all things in common. They began selling their property, their possessions, and then sharing with them all as anyone might have need. As there were poor people, struggling people who had came to Christ on that day, people started selling their homes, selling their property, cashing in their 401 ks to say, here, how can I help you? What are your needs? I will fulfill them. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're in this together for eternity. I will do all I can to help your needs. That is the kind of fellowship that we have in Christ that provokes giving of things that used to be valuable to us. This is the kind of spirit-filled life, the original spirit-filled church evidenced. And he says, they were devoted continually to the breaking of bread. Now, you may have heard this as an expression for the Lord's Supper. It's not. The breaking of bread did not become a technical term for the Lord's Supper for some time after this. This simply means they ate together. See, now all this talk I've been giving you for the last several years that food does not equal fellowship, you should have repeated this verse back to me and say, well, wait a minute. This is listed in the top four. Spirit-filled people Eat together. That's what Luke says. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Nothing here about the Lord's Supper. It means literally in the Jewish custom of taking bread and breaking it and then sharing it together. The Spirit-filled church in the beginning spent a lot of time, in fact, day by day, it says, meeting together in the temple and meeting together in homes of one another and eating, enjoying a meal. Sometimes, this is how my mind works, and this is, this is a rebuke to me. See, I'm a, I'm a teacher, right? That's, that's my, my primary gift. It's what I do. 
It's the most natural thing there is to me. And because that is my gift, I have a tendency, and I've certainly had this stronger in years past, but I'm getting over it. I have a tendency to evaluate everything that goes on in the church through the lens of teaching. And so whenever there's a need brought, whenever there's a concern, whenever there's something that should be done, I think, I need to teach a class. I need a sermon series. I need to do something to articulate the truth in this direction. And, and when you look through that lens, sometimes it's easy to minimize the importance of just hanging out together as believers, just sharing a meal. And this is a rebuke to me. The, the Lord has been rebuking me on this over the last few years. And once again, it reminded me as I was studying for the sermon that I'm not all the way there yet. Because even recently, I was telling somebody, eh, you, you really need to get involved in kind of a, some kind of a study as you guys meet together. I said, no, wait a minute. One of the four evidences of the Spirit-filled church in Acts 2 was they got together for a meal. There's no statement here that they always cracked open their scrolls and started walking through a text. They had their meals together, they were glad and had sing sincerity of heart. That, that phrase should probably be translated singleness of heart, or it could be simplicity of heart. They had one mind. So this is not just gathering at Starbucks and talking about football or, or some other cultural thing. Their focus was on the Lord. Their focus was on building up one another in the Lord. That I have no doubt. But it doesn't mean... They walked through, you know, the latest study that you buy at a Christian bookstore. It means they gathered together all the time to eat and just encourage each other in their journey to serve Jesus Christ. And so as we've made changes in small groups, and as we look at all the other ministries of the church, if some of those mysteries are, some of those ministries rather are something, something as simple as a chat a lot day, and you just get together and chat a lot, you see, you see what she did there? Isn't that clever? That's okay. It's biblical. It's what spirit-filled people do. So you people who get together a lot and talk, you have the scripture on your side. Just make sure, <laughs> just make sure your conversation is uniquely Christian because it's not true fellowship. And it's not the kind of breaking of bread these apostles or these uh, Christians were doing if unbelievers can do it. See, if unbelievers can do it, it's not fellowship. It's not the breaking of bread they were doing. But it's gathering together just to love each other. We're family. And we're fighting the battle together. We need one another. And some of the greatest times of fellowship and encouragement that I've experienced is on the golf course, See, I need a lot of encouragement on the golf course. Brother Dwight can testify to that. And, you know, after about the third swing, we decide it's time to talk spiritual things <laughs> because the, the round is shot already, so we might as well turn ourselves to eternal things. And great fellowship and great encouragement happens in those times. Not always are we cracking open the New Testament and digging into the Greek New Testament. The apostles' teaching is there, but so is just eating together. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Make it a point to have more believers in your home, to go to more believers when invited. Invite yourselves. I give you all permission to invite yourselves to other people's houses. We need to be doing this. And notice their interaction was not limited to the Lord's Day. Sunday morning says day by day. It amazes me, it, uh, maybe that's too strong, but it does catch my attention when we have 300 people coming here on a Sunday morning, but then we have other services, Wednesday nights, missions conference, women's conference and such, and the percentage of attendees is always a much smaller percent of the total. And I think, why is that? What are the things that we place as higher priorities than gathering together with the body of Christ? Is the Lord pleased with that prioritizing? Is it that we're spending so much time with believers that we don't have time to come together for those things? 
I want to encourage you to think about that, reflect on that. The Spirit-filled church in the first days, at least, couldn't get enough of one another. They wanted constantly to be in each other's homes because they were radically transformed and they realized no matter what their interests used to be, what their concerns used to be, what their desires for friendships and relationships used to be, everything has changed now. And the people we have the most in common with are believers. You realize, I hope, that you have more in common and more important things in common with the people in this room than your brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children who do not believe. The blood of Christ is a tighter bond than human blood. And we need to have the kind of devotion to one another where we can't get enough of each other. You know what happens when we do that, when we spend this kind of time together? It gets messy. Because we're uniting with a bunch of people who are sinners. And, and we get our feelings hurt. And our patience gets tested. My mom would say our, our nerves get wiry. And we get frustrated, we get disappointed, we get discouraged. And suddenly we fight the urge to not be with those people. And I want to challenge you to overcome that urge. Because these are the people you're going to spend eternity with. These are the people for whom Jesus Christ gave his blood. These are the ones that Jesus has handpicked to add to the church, to be his bride. And we need to love each other as the bride of Christ and eat together and share meals together and be glad together and have a single devotion, a single heart together. Fourth thing, fourth thing he says here is they were devoted to, the, to prayer and it's, it's literally the prayers, probably referring to the prayers at the temple. For a period of time, we don't know how long, while they were in Jerusalem, they would gather together in the temple and go through the Jewish prayers. But you know, and as well as I do, they prayed differently now. They prayed everything through the filter of Jesus. Now, one thing we know about the Jews when they prayed at the temple is it was many times a day. This was not just before meals. It wasn't an occasional prayer meeting several times a day. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we devoted to prayer? Formal meetings, small group prayer, individual prayers, family prayers, are we devoted like the Spirit-filled Christians on the day of Pentecost? Are we devoted to calling upon our Lord? And as we read through the New Testament, we learn the kinds of things they prayed about. They didn't pray so much for physical healing. I know for some of you, you get tired of hearing me say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. They didn't pray so much for physical healing they didn't pray so much for the details of life and for job situations. You know how they handled job situations, right? They sold their homes and took care of people who were in need. They prayed with a passion that other believers would grow in the knowledge of the Son of God. They prayed that the church would be filled and strengthened with faith. That the church would understand, that Christians would understand the hope of our calling, the hope that awaits us. That we would understand how valuable we are in Christ as God's inheritance. That we would understand the power of God given to us by the Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. They prayed for one another that each other would have a singular, unwavering commitment to Jesus Christ. And if you're familiar with Ephesians 1, in Colossians 1, you know I'm just taking it straight out of those chapters. Paul prayed passionately in Ephesians chapter 3 that his fellow believers at Ephesus would know the love of God and use three paradox paradoxical statements to say it. He was so emphatic here. He says, I want you to know the surpassing love of God, that which surpasses knowledge. I want you to know what you can't know. I want you to be filled full with God to the full. How do you get more full of God? You can't, right? He fills up all space, but he uses a paradoxical statement saying, I want you to be completely immersed and drowned in the love of God. And I want you to know the four dimensions of love. Height, depth, width, breadth, length. He's he just kind of going like this. I want you to know how expansive and big 
and indescribable is God's love. I want you to know His love. That's the kind of prayers these early Christians were involved with. That's the kind of prayers we should be praying for one another. Way more important than physical healing or getting a job is a person's passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ. I do not say that to say stop praying for healing and for jobs. Do pray for those things. But pray for them after you have first taken this man or this woman before the Lord and saying, Lord, strengthen their faith, strengthen their resolve and their love for you. Help him or her to know your love in this trying situation, in this very hard and painful providence. Give them an increasing understanding of your love, which is beyond comprehension. That's the kind of prayers they prayed. Is that the kind of prayers that we pray, and how often? Now, why is this the response? Why did they respond this way to the filling of the Spirit? Why did it promote these things, and why were they so consumed with the apostles' teaching and one another and such? I think the key is in verse 43. He says, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, or literally, if you have the NAS, it has a note there to this effect, fear was occurring to every soul as the signs and wonders were taking place to the apostles. These people had a deep fear of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? It means they understood Peter's sermon. Peter said these signs and wonders, these acts of Christ and his apostles are precursors to the coming of the day of the Lord, a great and terrifying day when God's judgment will be meted out. And these men understood. They deserved God's eternal wrath. They had crucified the Son of God. They knew the day of the Lord should be a day of utter condemnation and destruction for them, and they understood they'd been forgiven completely. And so now they lived their lives as they watched the apostles continue to perform miracles and such, They recognized those were indications that these men really were sent by Christ, signifying the coming of the day of the Lord. And now they realize what they had deserved, what they had been saved from, and they lived their lives with a a respectful understanding of God's holiness and wrath and joy that they had been forgiven. And that motivated them to reevaluate their entire existence. I mean, if we understand what we deserve, if we pour over our sin, if we think about how many different times and different ways we've offended God, and we start thinking about the fact that all it takes is one, one offense against God deserves eternal condemnation. When did you commit that first one, and how many have been added to it since? You start looking at the piles of sin that are attributed to your account, and that you deserve eternal wrath, and God has said, I forgive them all. It changes your perspective on life. Suddenly, the things that used to be so attractive, so appealing, that used to occupy your time, aren't so attractive anymore. We use phrases like, it's all going to burn anyway. Who cares about the house? Who cares about the car? It's all going to burn. Now, there is teaching on being good stewards, don't get me wrong, but the point is, the, the, the lust of the flesh and the world, the things that draw Americans so uh, forcefully, the power, the hunger for power and wealth and pleasure, should become distasteful to us. We should lose our taste for them because all that matters now is living for eternity with Christ. We've been purchased. We've been bought. We've been forgiven. We belong to Him. And now we should want to be together with all of those others who have been purchased and bought and who will live forever. And we should walk through life with this sense of respect and awe of God's wrath, which will not any longer be applied to us, and His grace, which is applied to us. That's what I believe the Spirit used to motivate them to these things. A couple of 
Very quick wrap-up statements. Verse 47 says they were praising God. And how could we not? How can we ever stop praising? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing of all of His greatness. I hope you will come Thursday, or Wednesday night rather. You can come Thursday if you want, but nobody's going to be here. Come Wednesday night to our Thanksgiving service and come prepared to give thanks publicly to encourage your brothers and sisters and to give thanks to God who's provided every good thing. Come together in fellowship and praise Him. And then the phrase, and having favor with all the people. That's a strange phrase in the original. One word makes a difference. It could be having favor toward all the people. So we're not exactly sure whether Luke is saying all the people loved them and was gracious to them because of their lives, the way they were portraying loving kindness to each other, or whether they were showing loving kindness to the Jews, their fellow Jews in Jerusalem. It could go either way. Probably it was both true. So I'm going to leave that there for now. Keeping with apostolic numbers of application, I'm going to give you seven here. Actually, 12 is apostolic. This is just another biblical number, a revelatory number. Number one, communal, don't put it up yet. Communal living is not taught or modeled in the book of Acts or anywhere else for that matter. Though these people were selling their property and giving to others, there is no call anywhere for the church to just always sell all their stuff and pool their money together. People who come along, Christians who come along and say, you need to do that, you need to watch out for them. It never turns out well. Later on, we're going to find people still owned houses. And Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira, the money it was yours before you came here, right? So we're never called to just sell everything and give it to everyone. Now, Jesus may call individuals to do that. He did call the rich young ruler to that. And he may call some of us to do it and say, sell everything you have and come follow me. And if he calls you to that, you need to obey. But that is not a principle or a command binding upon all Christians. However, we must still ask ourselves, am I willing to give up my possessions to help needy Christians? Is there anything, you can put it up now, sorry. Is there anything I own that I would not give up to help my brothers and sisters? If so, what and why? Do you own anything that you would not sell to help a brother or sister in need? You need to ask yourself if that's true and why. Number two, which describes me better? Not me, but you. You ask yourself this. Devoted to studying the apostles' teaching or a weekly hearer of the apostles' teaching? Spirit-filled Christians are devoted to the teaching. They don't just show up on, on Sunday morning and listen for a half hour or an hour and then go on and don't touch it again. Number three, do I base my fellowship with other believers on Christ and the gospel or on some lesser commonality? Are we looking for the foundation of our unity in Christ or do we have something less important than that that we're looking for unification and fellowship with? Number four, do I have a deep desire to share meals together with other Christians? Remember the first believers gathered daily. How can I make more time to spend with my Christian family? Number five, do I attend Sunday morning meetings only? If so, what are my reasons for missing other meetings? And what might this indicate about what I am most devoted to? Number six, in God's perspective, am I devoted to prayer? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what I think or what anybody else in this room thinks, but what does God think? Would he say that person, those people, they're devoted to prayer? Number seven, have I expressed my gratitude to the Lord for adding me to his church? Have I done it lately? Now, I give you all these, and we'll post these on the website in a day or two, and you can go back through them. I hope you will. I do not ask you to ask these questions so that you go away condemned. Guilt will not motivate you to change anything sincerely. That's not what I'm asking. And I'm not even saying these things as a way of rebuke primarily. I'm just saying, looking at the text that we've looked at here, 
We all need to be under self-evaluation and say, Spirit of God, reveal to me where I need to be more Spirit-filled. And I want to encourage you to approach this with a desire to love, not to check boxes. Don't decide that from day to this, this day forward, I'm going to be here every time the doors are open because that's what I'm supposed to do. If, you, if that's your mindset, don't come. Okay, we'll come, but that's not the right mindset. Come because the Spirit of God has worked on you to have such a passion for your fellow believers that you want to be here when they are here, and you want to have them in your home and such. Don't just check boxes. Don't be moved by guilt. Be moved by a conviction and a filling of the Spirit of God. Now, having said all of that, if you are the kind of person that looks through the bulletin, you saw in the first, or you saw the title as a preview to paradise, and you're thinking, this, what he said, has nothing to do with paradise. Let me see if I can explain to you how it does and why I chose that title. What happened in the early church? What happened on the day of Pentecost? What happened when the Spirit of God was poured out upon God's people? I believe gave us a foretaste, a glimpse, a little shadow of what it's going to be like for all eternity. The greatest thing of being in the new heavens and new earth by far is going to be the fact that we are in the presence of Christ himself. There is no greater blessing ever, anywhere, period, none. It'll be the delight of our souls. It'll be the satisfaction, finally, of every need and want and craving we've ever had. To see Him in all of His glory. To be able to speak with Him and hear from Him. If that's not your heart's greatest longing, I'm not sure you're a Christian, frankly. Oh, what a day that will be. But sometimes we forget we're not going to be standing around his throne with harps singing for the next gazillions of years. Those of you in, in Dwight's Heaven class, I'm sure, have gotten this. We're going to be on the new earth here. It's going to look, look a lot like this place. I'm happy to live right where I do at 2462 Vintage Drive, Colorado Springs. I'm happy to live there for all eternity. I love this place. And just imagine what it's going to look like when it's glorified. And we are going to be together for eternity, but the difference is going to be we're going to be together without any hint of sin. No more selfishness, no more pride, no more anger and bitterness, no more wishing we were spending time with somebody else. Forever and ever and ever we're going to be together. And this early pouring out of the Holy Spirit gives us a little glimpse of what it's going to be like. Here are three ways I see it. The new community created by God's Spirit was profoundly united and devoted to each other. Peace, harmony, love, sacrifice, generosity, worship, eagerness to learn, prayer. They were not Lone Ranger Christians. God does not bring people into His church without bringing them into the people of the church. He doesn't create individual Christians and leave them as individuals. He incorporates them into the body. The unity and devotion were expressed tangibly through their mutual desire to learn, to hold things all, all things in common, to eat meals together, to pray together. And this unity previews paradise where we will be together in love and devotion forever in His presence. Number two, this was the true Israel. These were the people upon whom God had poured out His promise of the Holy Spirit. They had been waiting for generations after generations to receive this promise, and they did. But these, all of these people were ethnic Jews. But the New Testament goes on to reveal to us that the true Israel is not made up of only ethnic Jews. It included all of us, all the Gentiles who would come in. God's Spirit is poured out. And all believers, all who are in the real church, are the true Israel. And what this does is gives us a preview of that scene in Revelation 7, when from every tribe, tongue, and nation, people are gathered together in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now, these people were all ethnic Jews, but do you remember? They were all from different nations indicating where the gospel would go, fore-signifying that time 
when we will be with him forever. And the last one, these initial converts were responsible for killing God's son. It doesn't get any worse than that. What this means is, beloved, there are going to be people standing there who have committed the most heinous of sins. There are going to be former child molesters and prostitutes and radical Muslims and all kinds of other really evil people who by the grace of God are going to have received forgiveness for their sins and they're going to be standing right next to you and me and they're going to be standing wearing white robes in His presence forever. There is no sin you can have committed that is beyond His reach. And this multitude of people who were so hostile to God's own Son are going to be standing there with us in those white robes. And forever and ever and ever, we will stand in the presence of Jesus Christ and praise Him and thank Him for His righteousness given to us and His forgiveness. He was previewed there. Someday, in paradise, it will become an eternal reality. Like the choir and the worship team to come forward now and lead us in some songs of response as we anticipate that day and call one another to devotion until then. Shall they stand? Let's stand together and sing.